Hey guys, it's ShadsofSun11 here. You know, in my time on YouTube, I've made plenty of different types of videos. Two types of videos I've made would be video game reviews and let's plays. However, there's a certain someone who often can't tell the difference between a review and a walkthrough for a video game. That person in question is George Wood, also known as Navigator. Navigator has a YouTube channel and does a series called Gaming in the Clinton Years, which pretty much speaks for itself. He reviews video games from Clinton's years as president. So, you should see a fair few PlayStation and Nintendo 64 games reviewed. When you first watch these reviews, they seem to be professionally made, but with the effort of a primary school student. And one main problem he has with certain reviews is he often does walkthroughs rather than actually talking about the game. Because his reviews are so short, I'm going to look at two. The ones I will look at are Super Castlevania 4 and Toy Story, both for the SNES. So, let us start with his Super Castlevania 4 review. Okay, I don't even have any comments on that intro. A battle toad riding a hockey puck, knocking over bowling pins with a picture of Bill Clinton on it. Yeah, this is one of those intros that's just so bad it's funny. That's all I can say about that. Hello? Navigator? Are we even there? Dracula is back. Revived as he is every hundred years in Konami's Super Castlevania 4. You play Simon Belmont, the descendant of the hero in Castlevania 2. Wait, what? The descendant of the hero in Castlevania 2. Castlevania 2? Full title being Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. Simon Belmont is the main character in Castlevania 2 as well, you know. You must have meant Castlevania 3, because Simon Belmont is the descendant of Trevor Belmont. Gah, how could you have made such a stupid mistake in script writing? I said this to NC17, I said it to Game Dude, and now I'll say it to Navigator. You are an idiot! Graphics are richly sublime, and the settings are always eerie combined with the well-done moody music. Konami has a classic on their hands with this game. Oh, and by the way, it's pronounced Konami. Just letting you know. The challenge level is immediately noticeable, and play control is considerably better than the last games. If you thought the character felt stiff in earlier outings, you'll be surprised at how versatile Simon is in this game, especially when he swings. I hope you found that informative because that's the last point in this video where you could even classify this as a review. This grid is the password to Castlevania 4. Wait, wait, wait. This is supposed to be a review, and you're showing the password to get to the final boss? This isn't a code guide, you know. In a review, you should be discussing about the gameplay, the levels, and giving your own constructive thoughts on the game. But you're not supposed to, like, reveal codes and cheats and all that. God. GET THAT POINT, STUPID! That will send you straight to Dracula without playing any of the levels. Or alternatively, you can just play through the game itself to get to Dracula. And that's better. Reasons. 1. You'll have much more fun in your quest to take down Dracula. 2. You'll get more of a full experience from the game to get your money's worth. And free, you actually get the feeling of satisfaction, because you feel more like you accomplished something and that you earned it. But Navigator likes to promote using cheat codes to skip levels. Is he in any relation to Chris Bors, I wonder? But anyway, he still likes using codes. Just remember this throughout the whole commentary. This is a key moment. Look at it for a few seconds and write it down quickly. Or how about instead of skipping the levels, play the game normally like it's meant to be played. You'll thank me later, because Super Castlevania 4 is an awesome game.
you'll find yourself at the bottom of the stairs leading into Dracula's room. I didn't know. Before you seek Dracula, jump off the edge of the platform to the left. Have no fear of jumping to your death. Great, now he's spoiling game secrets as well. If you want to show secrets of the game, that's for a hints video or a playthrough, not a review. Because an invisible platform will break your fall. Walk along this invisible platform until you're right next to the castle, then jump up. The result of this act will be a pleasant surprise. You'll receive full energy, 99 hearts, the triple shot, and the boomerang. Oh, and just to let everyone know, the clip shown here is the ending to the game. Way to spoil the ending, Navigator. You might as well go the whole hog and show how to beat Dracula as well. With this supply of goodies, you'll be ready to trash Dracula once and for all. To get back to the visible platform, walk right very slowly. By watching your feet closely, you'll be able to see that you're walking up invisible stairs. When your feet appear flat, jump back to the visible platform carefully. From there, walk up the stairs and meet the infamous Dracula. To beat the Dark Prince, jump up and hit R to release boomerangs. Oh, okay, so he is going to spoil the final boss as well. Here's a little question. Who are the main people who watch reviews like this? People who haven't played the game yet and want professional advice from reviewers on whether the game is good or not. Now, how would you feel watching a review for a game that you want to play but haven't yet? only to find the stupid moron spoiling the final boss by showing how to beat it. I'd be pretty pissed off. Spoilers are something you have to try and avoid when making reviews. Or the least you could have done was given a spoiler warning. Do that three times. If the height is right, those boomerangs will automatically be flying to Dracula's head to hit him in three quick blows. Be sure to keep jumping and pressing R so the boomerangs are always in the air. This attack style is very powerful. As Dracula appears from the stream of light, whip him twice to destroy his fireball which splits in two, then jump over the resulting two mini fireballs. When he starts to throw little balls of light, whip them and run into the center of the resulting spray to get energy replacing meat. And yep, yeah, he pretty much explains every attack Dracula uses. You know, when I got to Dracula, I didn't know how to beat him at first, but you know what? I figured out the boss's programming by myself. I got my ass kicked a lot of the time, but I learned from my defeat, and by beating him that way, I felt much more satisfied with my victory. But if you already know how to beat him, then that defeats the fun of learning as you go along. This is also something Irate needs to consider as well. Soon Dracula will make two streams of fire appear. Stay in or out of the pair of flames. They will disappear in a moment, but when they do, two big blobbish fireballs will start floating at you. Your boomerang should stop their path if you are still jumping and throwing them. You know what I find funny also? Is how when he's showing how to beat the final boss for the game, he goes into every last detail for all the attacks, how to dodge them, and how to attack him back. But when it comes to the actually important things in a review, like the gameplay and the levels etc, he's always very brief in explaining them, almost as if they're not as important. That's a sign of any bad video game reviewer. Another way to deal with fireballs is to get in a corner, let them draw near and jump over them from the corner, and finally turn and whip them. Remember to maintain the boomerang releasing. When Dracula resorts to his lightning attack, stay between the rays as you keep jumping and releasing boomerangs. If you stay a little to the side of Dracula, you should usually be safe from the lightning. Defeating Dracula requires the utilizations of all the skills already mentioned. I guess that's why it's the final boss, because it takes all your skills of dodging, whipping, and throwing weapons, etc., and puts them to the test. Super Castlevania 4 is the first 16-bit Castlevania game, and with the quality shown here, we can't wait till the second. The qualities which you barely touched upon in this review? Seriously though, this review did no justice to Super Castlevania 4. He didn't talk about how creative the levels are when it comes to the design, and how Simon can whip in all 8 directions, and how fun and challenging the game is etc. In fact, most of this video was just a strategy guide on how to beat the final boss. At least have the courtesy to say so, just come clean and honest about it. If you want my recommendations, get the game. It's a fun action platformer with great controls, awesome music, well-designed levels, and near-perfect difficulty. 
but we're not done yet. There still is Toy Story review to go. So without further ado, let's get this over with. The first Super Nintendo game ever from Disney Interactive is Toy Story. When you pop in this game, the first thing you notice is the poor edging on Woody. Oh, and what I also forgot to mention is that Navigator is another graphics whore, just like any other bad video game reviewer. If you noticed at the beginning of both of these reviews, the first thing he brings up is graphics. He always likes to nitpick graphics not meeting his standards. To me, Woody doesn't look too bad, at least not bad for 16-bit standards. But let's see what Navigator has to say about this. The main character of the movie and the character you control in the game. The Toy Story movie was done with silicon graphics computers. Ah, silicon graphics. Navigator loves silicon graphics the same way Irate Gamer loves food. And the instruction booklet says the game's graphics were created with the same 3D computer models that were used in the making of the blockbuster movie. We don't know, however, if the game actually used silicon graphics computers. What, were you expecting the graphics to be as crisp and clear as the graphics from the movie? Did you really believe the SNES could handle that? Even if silicon graphics computers were used or not, the SNES's graphics can only do 16-bit. If SGI computers were involved, we suspect they were only used for character animation, because the backgrounds do not have the detailed quality graphics of Donkey Kong Country. Wow, nitpicking about the graphics by comparing them to Donkey Kong Country's visuals. I also now wonder if this guy is Game Dude's biological father, because he nitpicks just as much. As any good devoted game player knows, Donkey Kong Country was created with Silicon Graphics computers and doesn't have edging problems. And another thing any devoted game player should know is that graphics do not make the game. Gameplay does. What's even more strange is that Woody is the only character with edging problems. All the other characters look great. Then it's official. Navigator is a nitpicker and proud of it. The game's packaging box advertises an intensely 3D experience, but that statement is a bit misleading because the gameplay, although varied, is often two-dimensional. Oh, sorry, did you not know? This game was made in the era of 2D gaming. 3D games were harder to make for a console with limitations like the SNES. Did you want a 3D game on the SNES? Well, you're going to have to wait for the Nintendo 64 to come out to satisfy your nitpicky need for graphics. One question still remains. Why didn't Disney Interactive use Silicon Graphics computers for the entire game? Um, uh, teacher? I, I, I know the answer. Uh, who gives a rat's ass? Well said, Boomstick. The real question here, though, should be, why are you still going on about the graphics? It's been over a minute in this review, and he hasn't talked about the gameplay once. Seriously, stop being such a moaner about silicon graphics. Were they too expensive? I don't think so. Come on, Big Disney is one of the richest corporations in the country. Let's get real here. Maybe Disney Interactive wanted to focus more on making the gameplay good. I mean, after all, isn't that what we play games for? Who really gives a rat's ass about the graphics? The only explanation we can think of is that Disney Interactive did not use SGI computers because the graphics could not be handled by the Genesis for the Genesis version. You really think so? Well then, Navigator, I ask you to play Vector Man and then tell me that the Genesis is weaker than the SNES. In terms of graphical capabilities, the two consoles were pretty even. I mean, after all, they're both 16-bit. Maybe that's why the game has nowhere near as many colors and detailed graphics as Donkey Kong. However, even that explanation doesn't seem plausible, because Disney would have to be insane to pass up the chance of creating another Donkey Kong Country. Okay, two things. One, Toy Story is nothing like Donkey Kong Country. Donkey Kong Country is about rescuing your stolen banana horde from King K. Rule. Toy Story is about toys who come alive when their owner isn't around. They're completely different. And two, are you seriously saying this all because of the graphics? You are really nitpicky about graphics to the point where you want games to use the same graphics as Donkey Kong Country. Besides, the Genesis version and the Super NES version don't have to be exactly the same, so what's the big deal? Disney certainly has the money to make another Donkey Kong Country, but unfortunately, they blew it. That's because Disney weren't even trying to make another Donkey Kong Country. Now, let us please get off this subject. 
Another thing that confuses us is Disney's marketing strategy. Since Pocahontas appeared in the theaters before Toy Story, why did the Toy Story video game come out before the Pocahontas game? I can offer some explanations for this. 1. Toy Story got much more promotion and hype, so they obviously wanted to release the game first to coincide with it being the big blockbuster movie. 2. Not all movies needed a video game. And 3. Even if there was going to be a Pocahontas game, who says when it needs to be released? It could be made any time after the movie's release. But then again, I guess you're the marketing expert. Perhaps the Pocahontas game is being saved until the movie is released on video for some sort of joint marketing strategy. The last negative thing we have to say about this game is about the play control. In the third level, players will start foaming at the mouth when they can't jump up to the rope at the top of the screen. No matter how fancy you get in trying to bounce off the ball and up to the rope, you will most likely not reach the darn thing. See? It's not hard. All you have to do is take a leap of faith. This kind of play control flaw is inexcusable, since Disney should have noticed it and fixed it. Realistically, you could end up trying 20 times to get Woody to grasp that stupid rope before you actually get it. You might get so mad at Toy Story that you may want to slam Doom into your Super NES and take out your anger by shooting a bunch of evil aliens. Then again, Doom is an extremely difficult game, so it might just make the problem worse. So, Navigator's point here is all games that are really hard lead to frustration. This guy is unfucking believable You might think we've come down hard on Toy Story. Oh no, not at all. I mean, all you did was nitpick the game's graphics and complain about it being too difficult. I don't think you've come down hard on it at all myself. Well, we admit we have. It's a shame, though, that the outstanding gameplay quality, resulting from the developer's hard work, is masked by the impossibly high challenge level. Here we go. Navigator complains about games being too difficult by saying the challenge is impossibly high. I admit this game is too hard for a kid's game, but it's not impossibly hard like what Navigator says. Toy Story is too difficult, like The Lion King. Fortunately for you though, we've discovered two awesome ways to cheat in Toy Story. And now we've hit it, the point in the review where Navigator goes on about cheat codes. Please refer back to an earlier point in the commentary because I am not repeating myself. In the first level, bounce off the first beach ball you see and land on the bottom drawer of the dresser on the right. Duck down until the sheriff's star icon starts spinning in the upper left corner of the screen. Next, get on top of the dresser where you'll find the bucket of toy soldiers. Stand on top of the bucket, then press down while waiting for the lid to move ten times. At this point, the stage select is activated. To skip any stage at any time, just press start followed by select. Yep, Navigator sure loves using his stage select codes. You can't win Toy Story without cheating. What a bunch of crap! Great, it's Vib113 all over again. Just because you can't beat something doesn't mean no one else can. I've seen walkthroughs on the internet. People have beaten this game without cheating. And this cheating brings victory much too quickly to warrant spending your money. Then the answer is simple. Don't use cheats. No one is forcing you to use them besides yourself. And this also goes against everything you said earlier about using stage select codes and cheating. And now all of a sudden you say that it brings victory far too quickly? Well, duh. This is hypocrisy at its finest. People don't spend 60 bucks on a game they know they can beat. That's why we do game rentals. With that in mind, one wonders why companies release game codes and stage selects. Video game buying has become too much of a game. No pun intended. Sorry, but what pun? The game is about finding a game that's not too hard, but not by any means easy. Navigator, is there ever a happy medium for you with difficulty? Codes and other cheats make games easy and not worth buying. As I said before, codes are entirely optional. Nobody but yourself is forcing you to use them. And by saying codes make games not worth buying, are you saying most of the Sonic the Hedgehog games aren't worth buying? Because they have codes as well, you know. The whole purpose of a stage select code is if you shut the game down and want to pick up from where you last left off, and if it doesn't have a save feature. It's that simple. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell if a game will last, or if a code will be released that makes it yesterday's news. This guy is unfucking believable I agree with you, Christopher Walken. It seems Mr. Wood doesn't even know what he's saying anymore. 
There is, however, one last bastion. Role-playing games like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy III. Wait, why are we now talking about Chrono Trigger? This is a review of Toy Story. Get back on topic. These games will never fail you as far as challenge goes, but the potential for these games to become interactive movies has yet to be realized. With the Nintendo Ultra 64, however, that will surely change. Some of you may have seen screenshots of Toy Story and thought the graphics were poor. It depends whether or not the person was a big graphics whore, because I thought it looked pretty decent. Indeed, screenshots do not represent the game well. And yet you just did that at the beginning of your review, judging the game by its visuals. Hypocrite much? Seeing the game in motion may actually impress you. Although Toy Story's graphics aren't perfect, they are pleasant looking, and the gameplay is refreshing. Which is a good thing. In the first level, for example, you have to let the toy troops out of their bucket. And here we go. It's now time for another Navigator Game Guide. Stand next to the bucket and press A. Then listen. A perfect soundbite from the movie. Too bad it's one of the few in the entire game. I don't think the SNES would have been able to support full voice clips. Believe it or not, the console does have limitations. Your chore doesn't end there though. Once you've dispersed the troops, go knock the walkie-talkie off the shelf by standing next to it, kneeling and pressing A. The walkie-talkie will fall onto the floor so the troops can carry it downstairs and set up their recon post. Next, head right to the walkie-talkie that Woody will use to communicate with the troops. In the second level, the goal is to get all the toys back where they were before Andy gets upstairs and finds them out of place. You mean like, in the movie? Not the blocks out of the pig's way. When you say, the pig, don't you mean ham? So he can get down to the floor. Get on the pump and get ready to jump on it when the pig walks by so that you can boost him into the toy chest. Repeat this process with the little toy robot, then do the same for Rex. Well, at least he called Rex by his proper name. The wimpy but lovable green dinosaur. Hey, at least he isn't Barney. Is this a joke? Next, knock blocks away with your pull string by pressing A to free the action figure toy named Biff. Actually, the wrestler's name is Rocky. If you read the mission briefing, it even says his name's Rocky. Speaking of action figures, take a look at this one. It's a takeoff of Blanca. Good lord, how many times now has Navigator gone off subject? I honestly lost count from Street Fighter 2. Also notice the similarities to other Street Fighter characters on the package design. Aha! We caught these guys ripping off Capcom. Anyway, let's get back to Toy Story. Yes, that would be a wise idea, wouldn't it? Once Biff is free, he will push the bucket over to the crane. The crane will then raise the bucket so the remote control race car can pass underneath. Biff and the car will get back to their place under the bed. So all that's left for you is to get in your place, which is on the bed. Do that and the level will end. Next you must battle a- He also forgot to mention the level where you have to keep up with Buzz that comes before the boss. Nightmare version of Buzz Lightyear. Hit him on his face shield with your pull string while avoiding Buzz's lasers. You don't seem to be trying very hard to dodge his lasers. Buzz will warn you before he shoots a laser, so be sure to listen carefully for his egotistical taunting. As for the rest of the game, we have a few general hints for you. First of all, collecting stars helps you stay alive, so even though the task is boring, do it anyway. Complaining about this would be like complaining about collecting rings in Sonic the Hedgehog. Second, read the messages put up by the Etch-a-Sketch before each level. It tells you what to do. I didn't know. Third, don't try to rush through the third level to beat Buzz Lightyear. You'll never win. After all, he is a space ranger, or at least he thinks he is. Lastly, we recommend seeing the movie first so you don't have to read all the boring text in between the stages. I'm sure the majority of people who play these games are people who have already seen the movie first. Bottom line, when all is said and done, Toy Story has better gameplay than either of the Donkey Kong Country games. Wait. Are you telling me that after criticizing this game, you now say it's better than Donkey Kong Country, which you once said was the game of the decade? Again, Navigator seems to go from criticizing the game harshly to, this game is great. Again, he's just full of his own bullshit. And players should even be able to adjust to the flawed play control. Toy Story's great gameplay is shrouded, however, by frustrating challenge and play control. That was a bit self-contradictive there. Saying you can adjust to the play control, but then going on to say the play control is a hindrance to the game. And the cheating methods destroy what's left of the game after that. Please refer back to an earlier point in my commentary, because I am not repeating myself here. 
Now, check out our review of Toy Story, the movie. Okay, so that's it for Navigator's reviews. Well, I can say that the Toy Story review was much more painful to endure, being that it's one of his longest reviews, but both were pretty putrid. So now to sum up both reviews. His Super Castlevania 4 review was about 20% of actual reviewing, and 80% spoiling the final boss and giving codes. And Toy Story consisted of a huge moan fest of graphics whoring, and the high difficulty level. He also didn't seem to know what he was talking about, and the bit where he complained about level select codes, despite him using them all the time, proved that he's full of his own bullshit. Granted, he does seem professional at first, but that means nothing when he reviews like it was written by a five year old. I'm not going to bother giving him criticism, as apparently George Wood is dead, but what I will do is a HDG on how to do video game reviews properly. So here is Tom the Hedgehog's handy dandy guide. Okay, so what I'm going to do is a HDG on how to do proper video game reviews and not end up like Navigator. Step 1, know your video. There's no point in doing video game reviews if you don't even know how to lay out one properly. A review is an in-depth look at the game where you discuss the gameplay, design, and other things whilst giving your own constructive thoughts on it. Reviews do not consist of showing codes and how to beat bosses and levels etc. That's for the player to figure out by themselves. Which brings us to our next step. Step 2. Avoid spoilers. Realistically, most of the people watching your reviews will have not played the game and want professional advice on whether or not they should get it. If you give spoilers to the final boss or stage select codes etc, people will be pissed off at you, basically because you ruined their learning experience by showing them how to beat the bosses and all that. If you do have spoilers, make sure to give warnings, otherwise don't spoil anything. Step 3. Stay on subject. Navigator occasionally got sidetracked in his reviews. He was reviewing the game for one minute and then talked about action figures and different games etc. For a review to be laid out professionally you need to stay on subject otherwise people could get confused and not bother watching the rest of the video. And finally step 4 gameplay first. Every devoted gamer should know that the gameplay is the game's most important aspect above everything else. Graphics, difficulty and realism are not major factors to affect the game. By making big complaints about the game's graphics, games being too difficult and not realistic, it makes you sound like an idiot and unprofessional. You can talk about the graphics if you want, but focus on gameplay more. And as Navigator's reviews seemed extremely brief, try to go into explanatory detail on the games because you might know what the game is like, but that doesn't mean everyone else will. So try to elaborate on gameplay to prove your points further. So there you have it, a HDG on the key points to making video game reviews and how not to review like Navigator. If you felt enlightened by this commentary, then feel free to leave a comment, and if not, well that's a kiss on my ass. So, thanks for watching, this is Shadsoft7, signing out. It's official, you suck.